The times have changed, so has the delivery of news. We believe local news needs to be easily accessible. Hey, Owensboro, get with the times. Subscribe today at owensborotimes.com. Hi, I'm Matt Castle with Castle Steel. And I'm Daniel Dick with Daniel Dick State Farm. And we're proud to partner with Owensboro Times. It's never been more important than now to meet the candidates. It's a vital part of our Republic democracy for candidates to come forward and run for public office. I'm grateful for the individuals willing to run on the issues that are important to them and this community. Thank you for your willingness to serve the people of Owensboro. Lastly, we want to thank you for joining us. The town hall begins now. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Owensboro Times Primary Election Town Hall. I'm Jake Boswell. I'll be moderating this event. First, I'd like to explain the format to you watching, streaming live at home, and also to everybody here at our facility. Candidates drew for their spot on stage upon arrival today. We did that just a few moments ago. Candidates were given topics ahead of time, but specific questions we're going to be asking, they'll be hearing for the first time here during this event. Candidates are going to have 60 seconds to answer each of these questions, and the order in which candidates respond will be reversed each question. Each candidate will also be given 60 seconds to deliver a closing statement. The community's input was factored heavily into the formation of the questions you're going to be hearing to make sure that we address the most important topics to you. Guests will not be allowed to ask questions here in the audience during the event. Guests here in attendance, please Hold your applause until the forum for this race ends. In the third of our nine segments today, we'll be joined now by four candidates for Davis County District Judge. We'll introduce you to our candidates, and then we'll get started. Joining us are Jay Nick Payne, Shannon Meyer, Heather Blackburn, and Philip Page. Our first question goes to you, Mr. Payne. A district court judge presides over a wide range of cases, including criminal, small civil disputes, probate cases, and guardianship and disability cases. What qualifies you to preside over these cases? I think all of us up here have all passed the bar. We've been practicing lawyers for a long time. I have personally been a prosecutor for 20 years. I know the criminal laws up and down and backwards and forwards. Um, probate, I know I've been researching probate, and I believe that all of us can do the job. It's about docket management. It's about knowing how to move the docket along on each and every one of those cases. You know, there's gonna, not any of us know the law perfectly every time, but we all take time, know the law, apply the law to each and every case, and do that properly. Um, district Court does see the widest variety of cases and the widest variety of people, and it's how you listen to the case, how you deal the case, and how you apply that law that is going to make a difference in that case and let it be decided. Ms. Meyer, the same question to you. What makes me qualified to deal with the cases that are faced in district court every day is first and foremost the fact that I am your current district court judge. So I'm in court every day. Mondays I have my juvenile division. On Wednesdays we hear our probate matters, our small claims matters, and our hospitalizations. And then on Friday, we get to hear our traffic cases, uh, which involve a lot of criminal actions and also violations of different local city ordinances. Prior to being a judge, I also was in private practice, and I was a prosecutor for 21 years. So that combination of experience certainly qualifies me to continue doing the work that I'm doing as your district court judge. And Ms. Blackburn, same question. Thank you. First of all, district court affects every person in this community at some point, whether it's probate, a traffic ticket, a juvenile matter, evictions, all of it. For 22 years, I have been a public defender working exclusively in circuit and district courts. Every week of my career, I have been in district court. I have had dozens of jury trials, both in circuit and district court. I have represented the guilty and I've represented the innocent. Being a public defender gave me a unique perspective, not in cutting people breaks or making things easy, but looking at the law and applying it as it is and not how I wish it to be. 
That experience makes me uniquely qualified to be on the bench. Everything about court is about public service, and I have been a public servant for this community for the past two decades. And Mr. Page, same question to you. Thank you. What uniquely qualifies me for the position of district judge is that I am currently a prosecutor in district, judge, in district court. As a prosecutor, as echoed by the rest of my candidates that are up here, we do see a lot of different kind of cases, and it is the first court that the public sees. But more specifically, as a prosecutor that practices in front of district court, I'm also the one who presents and is in charge of presenting those cases to the judge. So what the judge actually considers are the things that I'm deciding upon speaking with the officers, speaking with the victims, and then conferring with the public defender if they've been appointed, or with a private attorney if they've been appointed, or maybe even with just the accused if it's something that they couldn't go to jail for or something that they would have less than a $500 fine for. So as the prosecutor, I'm presenting those to the judge. So a lot of what they even consider are the things that I've already packaged and presented uh, at fairly before the judge, for the court. Move along to our second question now. And Mr. Page, this time you'll be going first. As reported by local law enforcement, juveniles have been involved in several crimes in recent months, including those involving guns. Right. What changes would you make as a judge to reduce the number of juvenile offenders in our community? Thank you for that question. So right now, I am the juvenile prosecutor, one of the juvenile prosecutors, there's two of us, before district court. And so I've seen these cases, I've seen these families, I've talked to the offenders, I've talked to the victims. I've talked to the police officers that come in and they call me at two o'clock in the morning. That's also part of being a prosecutor is you're on call, just like district court judges are. So as I'm answering these calls and I'm presenting these cases before the court, I have to determine what is most fair in presenting these and how can I best prosecute these cases. As a judge, what I would do slightly different when it comes to it is really on the back end of it is trying to encourage other ways and encourage community involvement in these kind of cases. We have different laws that are on the books like Marcy's Law where they have given rights to victims and the ability to be heard and to be uh, accounted for in court. And I would encourage more uses of that and the more use of the offender taking accountability in their uh, alleged offenses. Ms. Blackburn, we have the same question to you. What changes would you make as a judge to reduce the number of juvenile offenders? Thank you. I think that's a really hard question to answer because one of your jobs as a judge is to be impartial. So you have to take each case individually and that's especially true in juvenile court. There's also been a systemic change in the juvenile statutes. As judges, you have to apply the law not as you wish it were, but as it is. That's all part of the due process. That doesn't mean you check your common sense at the door, not at all. But what it does mean is we still have to follow the law. There is no denying the uptick in juvenile violence. We've seen it, um, and certainly in my 20 years, we used to go years without a homicide, without a shooting, and that has changed in Davis County. Uh, the judges do have the ability and the power to uh, hopefully divert some of these kids into programs early before it gets to that point. But it is a collaborative effort quite often with the Department of Juvenile Justice, Community Services, and quite honestly, sometimes the adult justice system is required. And Ms. Meyer, the same question to you now. What changes would you make as a judge to reduce the number of juvenile offenders? Well, first, with the way the question is worded, I want to commend Heather that she is correct that um, judges and judicial candidates are prohibited by our judicial canon of ethics to speak about issues and on matters on which we may ultimately rule. But in light of those rules, and certainly in strict compliance with those rules, I will tell you this. Juveniles must first be treated as humans. And that is not to say that they're to get away with whatever they've done. There are consequences to our behavior. And I think as juveniles, whether they come from a home that doesn't enforce consequences or not, when they walk into my courtroom, they know that whatever the consequences will be, the consequences are suited to what offense they've been accused of committing. Um, there's also a certain relationship between myself and a judge and the prosecutor that we've got to trust that the charges that are brought before, of us, before us aren't amended. Sometimes our hands are tied as a judge, but I can tell you when the charges are before me, I look at the law, the circumstances, and I certainly am not afraid to apply the consequences that they really should be facing. 
Mr. Payne, same question to you. What changes would you make as a judge to reduce the number of juvenile offenders in our community? As I said, I've been doing this now for tw over 20 years. I've been practicing law for 23 years. When I first started in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, youthful offenders, those are the juveniles that have been waved up to circuit court, were rare. Since then, it has been becoming a problem of, and once they get up into circuit court, once they have that felony, their lives are essentially ruined. District Court, I ran two years on this platform and I still believe this, is the first line of intervention for these juveniles. They see these juveniles first, they can interact, they can learn, they can apply the law, but they can use compassion in that and they can be firm in their rulings. Um, there needs to be something done to get their attention so they don't end up in circuit court, so they don't end up with their lives ruined. Um, the juvenile laws are specific, and as a judge, we will all follow those juvenile laws, but we will apply that, we will use our compassion, and we will use firm rulings, and hopefully make a difference in those lives. Well, thanks to all of you, really well thought out answers. Our next question is gonna be to you, Mr. Payne. What methods would you suggest to improve court procedures and efficiency? Court procedure and efficiency, um, you know, even before COVID, the district court system was backlogged just because of the nature of the cases, the amount of the cases, and just the sheer number of cases. Um, COVID has actually helped us learn that there is technology out there, there are programs out there that can help us speed up the system, that can help us apply, and as a district judge, I will not be afraid of using those, you know, if the funding's there for them, if we can get them used. Um, as a Commonwealth attorney, I was, one of the first ones when they brought up the rocket docket, it was under Bruce Kegel's watch. Uh, we discussed that, worked with everyone to get the rocket docket, which is a way of getting drug offenses out of district court faster and into rehab. Um, we are currently still working on that program and it's been a great success. So I'll use the, my knowledge of the treatment, my knowledge of technology, and my knowledge of the, with the Commonwealth Attorney's Office to move cases along and avoid needless delays. Ms. Meyer, the same question to you. What would you uh, suggest to improve procedures and efficiency? Well, I'm gonna have to start by saying that where I am now as your district court judge, I am blessed to work with a team of individuals. I don't think that our courtroom efficiency can fall solely on the shoulders of the judge. We have an excellent clerk staff. I have excellent staff in my office that help me to move my cases along, but at the same time, making sure that everybody who appears before me has my respect so much so that I listen to everything that they want to tell me. I follow the law and I make fair decisions when I do that. I've been doing a few things already that have changed the efficiency of the court. Um, one of the things is, and it's just because me personally, I don't need a lot of breaks. So when you see me in traffic court and we have 300 cases that we've got to get through, I'm not taking a lunch break, I'm not taking very many restroom breaks. The staff there, they're able to kind of come and go um, so that they can take a break as they need it. But my, myself, I'm there all day because I figure if I'm there all day, that's my job. But people who are there, they deserve the respect to have their heard, case heard and heard quickly so that they can go home and get about doing their business. Ms. Blackburn, the same uh, question to you. Uh, what methods would you suggest to improve procedures and efficiency in the court? Thank you. There are a few issues that will always be a challenge, and one is volume. And it is not unusual to have a 300 person docket. And while not everybody shows up and some of those are court costs, that still can be a challenge. I think we are very fortunate that there has been a collaborative effort with both the public defender's office and the, pro and the prosecutor's office to often have more than one individual down there working so that we can try to take care of everybody. And it's for a number of reasons. Uh, one is we don't want defendants who are working to lose a lot of time off of their jobs. And that can actually keep people from being successful when they end up losing employment because they're always in court. However, sometimes th some things like drug test results can take up to six to nine months, which can actually delay getting some of these DUI cases resolved. I think what we have learned, though, is that as a collaborative effort, we can get through these dockets a lot faster and a lot better. I think COVID has helped bring that along, that we've actually become a lot more efficient. And Mr. Page? Question to you, what methods would you suggest to improve court procedures and efficiency? Thank you, so some of the things, as my fellow candidates have already said, we've already put into place. Some of the things that we've learned through COVID that have worked and haven't worked. 
One of the things is people, a lot of times, they see TV and they think, well, that must be how court actually is for everywhere. And that's actually not true. So for example, during COVID, we learned that we could use monitors, we could use cameras, we could set up at the jail and actually have the, the uh, inmates, the prisoners, on jail docket on a video. So we set those at a certain time during the day on the docket. So instead of wasting time with having them transported over, instead of wasting time and money and manpower to get those people over here, we do it virtually. So that's one way in which we have actually improved efficiency and, and the method of, of doing things. Another way we've done it, and that I would also encourage and, and continue to do going forward, is how we organize which cases are heard when by front-loading the ones that are easier to get in and get out and hear them quickly, like your minor traffic offenses versus your more complicated things that do have a timeline that do take a while to get through and that are going to be contested would be later on or set for a better date. Thank you. We have a couple more questions to ask each of you, and Mr. Page, you'll have the opportunity to go first with this next question. What is your general judicial philosophy? All right. So my general judicial philosophy is that I actually don't have one, and what I do and how I do and every day is the same. Who I am today, who I am at home, and who I am in court as a judge. So you, once you put on the robe, for one thing, you're not who you used to be. So when I was a soldier, when I was in the Army, same thing. I became a soldier, I put on the uniform, and I have taken on a different personality. It's the same thing with the judge. It's the same thing with the prosecutor. You have rules and things that you have to follow in yourself. So by living to those higher levels of uh, ethic, ethical standards, by treating people as people and not as this is a file or this is a defendant or this is the person that's accused of whatever it is, by treating people with those respect and dignity, I do that not only as a person, I did it before, and I do it now as a prosecutor, and I would continue to do it as a judge. Ms. Blackburn, same to you. What's your general judicial philosophy? I think it's actually fairly layered. We have to have due process, and it has to be followed, and it has to be done consistently, fairly, and evenly. We have to apply the law as it is, not as we wish it were. We have to be knowledgeable. And what that means is we have to be receptive to learning all the time. Case law changes, rules can change. You have to stay on top of what's happening if you want to be an effective and fair judge. A lot of what has changed has been with Marcy's Law, and that is access to the courts for victims. Some of that Davis County was already doing. We've already been subpoenaing witnesses into district court and often giving it two or three attempts to get them to come to court. And while that's a delay, that access to courts is vital and important. Whether you're a defendant or a victim, a plaintiff or respondent, that access is something that is sacred, and that would be my judicial philosophy. Ms. Meyer, same question to you. My judicial philosophy is that the district court is the gateway to our judicial system. We see an, an extremely high volume of cases that come through the doors. Um, particularly in our traffic and misdemeanor court where people are first charged, um, whether it be a misdemeanor case, a traffic violation, or a more severe um, charge in which they're facing the possibility of being sent to the grand jury. Um, for me, my first consideration is the particular person and the offense with which they have been charged. So are they a proper candidate for some type of diversion program offered through our county's attorney's office, whether it's the shoplifting program or the marijuana program or the CATS program for traffic violations. If they're a good candidate for that, as a judge, that's the opportunity I want to give to them. If they take it and they make good on their efforts, then hopefully the goal is that we get folks out of the district court system so that they don't continue making bad decisions and wind up there over and over again. Mr. Payne, question to you, what is your general judicial philosophy? Uh, my general judicial philosophy is plain, pretty plain and simple. It's that a judge must know the law and a judge must always apply the law. Um, it really doesn't deviate from that. You know, I've, in my years of experience, I've been in front of some judges that say, I know what the law is, but nothing as a, in my judicial philosophy irks me more than a judge you know, they can interpret the law, they can use compassion, but the law is the law. It's ever-changing, and the judge must know that, but they must always follow the law, apply that law, and tell each and every person in front of them 
after listening to the case, after listening to those individual facts, because each case is different, but the law is not. How that law applies to them and why the judge is ruling that way. It's really pretty simple. Just follow the law. Our next question will be to you, Mr. Payne. You get to go first this time around. What are your views on alternative sentences for nonviolent offenders? District court especially has leeway in their sentencing. Um, you know, the judge is not involved in the plea negotiations. Judges can't, you know, I can't comment on what I would do or what I wouldn't do in any certain individual case. But, you know, district court is geared to, you know, especially the nonviolent people to get them into the rocket docket, gets them into treatment faster, you know. So alternative sentences for nonviolent, I mean, as a judge, if there is an agreement between the parties, I'm all for it. If there, it goes to trial and the jury has come back, I will listen to the attorneys, listen to each individual argument, and I will make a decision. I mean, there are definitely alternatives, especially in the nonviolent crimes, where people, a judge, can get people help in district court, both victims, both defendants, and help everyone involved. Ms. Meyer, same question to you. What are your views on alternative sentences for nonviolent offenders? Well, as I mentioned a moment ago, our county attorney's office actually has some really good options for diversion programs, so long as the defendants are um, a good candidate for those programs. And as your judge, the one thing that I look at when someone determining whether somebody is a good candidate for those programs is the number of prior offenses that they may have. So if somebody has been in my court with similar charges time and time again, certainly they're probably not gonna be the best candidate for one of the diversion programs. And then I must apply the law, whatever the maximum sentences are. Of course, mis class A misdemeanors can carry up to 12 months in jail and a $500 fine. If you're a class B misdemeanor, you've got 90 days in jail that you're looking at and a $250 fine. But there is leeway, as was mentioned, um, and as your district court judge, I'm certainly amenable to alternative sentencing, but make no mistake that if you're going to come into my court as a repeat offender, there are going to be consequences. Ms. Blackburn, same question. Thank you. As mentioned before, the county attorney's office does offer some really good diversion programs, and they've helped a lot of people, but they also cost money. So not everybody can afford to take those programs. Deferred prosecution does give first-time offenders an opportunity to get that charge off their record. Uh, hopefully they can get back on track again. But when somebody fails, it's up to the county attorney's office to put that case back on docket for any possible consequences they may be for that failure. The public defender's office also has on-staff social workers who we often utilize to divert people into programs when it is required and when it is necessary. I will tell you that the county attorney's office, when there is a victim, even in a nonviolent crime, makes recommendations based on victim input because that is required by Marcy's law. So I trust that the people who are talking and negotiating have done their due diligence in talking to victims and the defendants before bringing a plea offer to the front for me to accept. And Mr. Page, what are your views on alternative sentences for nonviolent offenders? Well, as a prosecutor right now in district court, I use those all the time. We use them every week for those that are appropriate for those cases that we need to apply them to. One of the things that we first started out this session with, though, was talking about probate court, and I like to actually spotlight Casey's Law. Casey's Law, for those of you that don't know, might want to Google it, talks about how you have individuals who have substance abuse issues. So they come to the court, the family or a petitioner comes to the court and says, hey, I need help with my brother, my sister, whoever it is that's addicted to heroin. They have issues. Well, when those are brought in as a private party thing, as a third party person, they bring it and present it to district court and that judge gets to hear it. As a prosecutor, I get to assist with the presentation of the evidence. But a lot of times what I'll do is I'll use those Casey's Law petitions in concert with something else that's also pending downstairs. So for example, if I have a, an individual who has five, six, seven, eight alcohol intoxications, I might also talk to the family and say, hey, have you considered Casey's Law? And let's talk about using all the resources in the court and not just one judge or one court on one day. This will be our final question before our 60 second closing statements. And Mr. Page, you have the honor of going first. Uh, Mental health has a huge impact on our community. We've probably seen that more the last couple of years 
uh, publicly than maybe any other past two years. Are, are there ways that you can respond to community needs from a judicial standpoint? Thank you. So one of the really interesting things about on Tuesday, I had the honor of attending the Lighthouse Banquet. And at that banquet, uh, Judge Joe Castlin was honored, he's a circuit court judge, with a, an award. And I was witness to that and I had the honor of being there. And what was really nice about it is that as when he first started and, and a few years ago when, when Lighthouse started, his encouragement and his partnering with the community to find a need and to find a program and to meet that need in another way. It's kind of how I said a minute ago when it talks about treating the person's actual issues and not just treating them like a criminal. Let's figure out some kind of way of how we can actually assist them with getting the help that they need instead of just, yes, let's give them consequences. Let's, yes, let's have them also involved in their um, means of, of reconciling whatever it was that they were in front of the court for. As the judge, I would also encourage those things and to encourage community partnerships. Ms. Blackburn, I'll ask you the same question. Mental health's got a big impact on our community. Are there ways that you can respond to community needs from a judicial standpoint? Thank you. Again, I, I've mentioned before sort of the collaborative efforts that we've had in district court. Uh, certainly, if somebody is seriously mentally ill, there is a dearth of available beds. It's hard to get people committed for treatment who need it. And quite often they end up arrested because of either some sort of intoxication or mental illness that looks an awful lot like it. I think we have to continue with what we have in place but make it even better. So the county attorney's office has a mental health person who tries to identify people early on who may be having a mental health issue, who are in the jail or in the system, but we also have, again, the public defender's office have social workers to try to plug people in, especially to dual diagnosis placements, which can cover both mental health, drug and alcohol issues. I think as, a, as judges, we'll have to always be receptive and open to the fact that sometimes the person in front of you is seriously mentally ill and not necessarily criminal, but having those resources and people in place makes all the difference. Ms. Meyer, same question. I think from a judge's point of view with respect to ways that we can respond to the community's need for mental health um, is first and foremost the recognition of just how quickly um, the problem of mental health issues have become. And when I say problem, our court systems are becoming inundated with folks, as Ms. Blackburn pointed out, who aren't particularly intentional in their criminal behavior, but certainly have underlying mental health issues that need to be addressed. We have um, a hospitalization process right now for guardianships and so forth if a person's family member is in need of that. And then there's a new law, Tim's Law, that's getting ready uh, to roll out. And Owensboro Davis County is actually going to be a pilot program that's going to be chaired um, for the moment by our circuit court, Judge Jones. Um, and we're all working together. We just had a meeting on it this week, in fact, on what we can do as a community. It was a meeting with um, River Valley Behavioral Health representatives and also the mental health coordinator in the county attorney's office. So we're certainly giving that a look and it, it certainly deserves um, options. And Mr. Payne, same question to you. Mental health is having a big impact. Are there ways you feel like that the judicial system could help with that? You know, the judicial system has always had difficulty handling mental health. Um, Funding, uh, lack of available beds, uh, you know, the, so it has always been. As a judge, you have to accept that sometimes, but you have to be aware of a lot of the people coming in front of you on the substance abuse issues are self-medicating. You know, they have a problem that it may look like addiction, but it is um, underlying mental health conditions. And that's something as a judge you need to recognize. Uh, there is a mental health court in place now that for the last couple of years and it has helped that process tremendously. As a judge, I'll continue to use and refer people to the mental health court. Um, we will use that, use social workers, use all available, you know, have to get creative because the funding's probably not gonna be there, but as a district court judge, you have resources available. You'll need to look at those resources, be diligent about getting the people into the right places, but yes, you can help, certainly help mental health be addressed better. That concludes the questions portion of the forum. You'll now each have 60 seconds to give us your closing statement. And Mr. Payne, you get to go first. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for listening to all of us up here today. Um, 
my name is Nick Payne. We're all excellent uh, candidates. Uh, what sets me apart in this um, is my experience. One, my prosecutorial experience. I've been doing this as a public servant, as a prosecutor for 20 years, and I've seen how a good district court judge can make a difference, especially in issues of like domestic violence, drug abuse, and um, youthful offenders that we talked about earlier. Uh, also, in my life experience, I have born and raised here. I am from Owensboro, graduated Owensboro Catholic High School in 1992. Um, always wanted to come back to this community and did as soon as this job became open. I have been a public servant in this community. I'm raising my children in this community. And, you know, I believe a judge can be a hardworking person. A judge can be a diligent person. And that the judge, if you elect me, I will work and continue my public servant in that capacity for this community. Thank you. Ms. Meyer, your 60-second closing statement. I was a prosecutor for 21 years, and I've seen that when district court functions well, it provides people an opportunity to leave a better person than when they came in, if they take that opportunity. I was a very tough prosecutor, but I was also fair, and I was told that by people that I prosecuted. So without a doubt, my experience as a prosecutor developed the strength that I needed to be tough, but it really wasn't until I became a judge that I was able to fully appreciate my calm, even keel demeanor that allows me to listen and to make decisions without interjecting my own personal beliefs and my personal feelings. So my experience both in my civil practice as well as the 21 years that I prosecuted allows me to be the firm but fair judge that I am. I'm honored to be your district court judge I'm good at it, and I want to continue being your district court judge. I'm asking for your vote. Ms. Blackburn, your opportunity for your closing statement. Thank you. I was born and raised in a small town in North Dakota, and I never thought I'd leave, but I fell in love with a military man, and when he left the Air Force, we made Owensboro our home in 1997, and we've raised our daughter here from the age of one. Military families don't get to choose where they live, but we chose here. When my husband was called to active duty after 9-11, he was gone for most of seven years, and the military gave us the opportunity to move with him. But we knew that the assignments would be short, maybe six months at the most. So we wanted to keep our daughter where we knew we had a community that loved us, that cared for us, and that we loved back. My family knows what it means to serve, whether it's as a military family or as a public defender. I'm ready to serve as your judge in district court. I've been doing it for 22 years in a district courtroom. I know it's about services, I know the law, and I know due process. So I'm asking you to vote Blackburn at the bottom of the ballot this week in May 17th. Mr. Page, your opportunity for your closing statement. Thank you. My name is Philip Page, I'm running for district judge. I too am not from here, not originally, I'm actually from Ohio. So back when 9-11 happened, I was in college. I was in my second year of school doing undergrad. And just as everyone else could probably remember exactly where you were when 9-11 happened. So during college, I decided then at that time I wanted to serve my country. I went and I enlisted, four years active duty. I also did two years reserves after that. So of all the candidates up here, I'm the one that served. I've actually been a veteran, went overseas, deployed, did all of that. Upon coming back, I did my master's degree from Youngstown State University, which is also a criminal justice administrative degree, uh, a degree that assists me in, in, with management and knowing how to manage an actual court system or a police department, so I have that also. I come from a steel worker background with lots of veterans, so I know all about hard work, and ever since I've been here, I've been here since 2015, I have spent at least half of those years volunteering right here in this community because Owensboro is my home now too. I'm on the Oasis board and the HL note board, and please vote for uh, Philip Page for district judge. Thanks to all of you for your time. I think anybody who, who's here in person or who's watched is much better for it, much more educated, and, and thank you guys for giving that to us. That wraps up our third session of the day. Thanks to everybody who took time to watch at home, if you're watching online, and, and thank you to each of the candidates for joining us here today. We also want to thank the Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame and Museum for allowing us to host this town hall here at their fantastic facility. And thanks to our presenting sponsors, Castlin Steele and Daniel Dick, State Farm Insurance Agent, and supporting sponsor, Mud's Furniture. We'd like to leave you with a final message. It's to make sure that you vote in the primary 
which you can do right now, and on election day, primary election day, May 17th. Our next forum will start at 3.30 for family court judge. In the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, your candidates for Davis County District Judge.